I guess I'll be the first one to enter the arena. Yeah. I have to clap and bow and I don't remember. Throw rice over my shoulder or something like that. I can't remember. Anyway. Yeah, culture nut product over my shoulder. Hey, everybody. Everyone have a good time and catch a can today. I didn't catch it, but I will if I can at another time. But anyway. Um, <laughs> so I just thought I'd start out by um, saying a few things about myself so that. Um, you know, in case you were going to ask me, I will have answered it already. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'll just let you know who I am, just very briefly, and then we'll open up to question and answer. So, um, one of the questions I get asked all the time is, how long, how long have you been vegan? Well, I have been vegan for over 30 years. Before, yeah, in the 1980s, um, I transitioned to veganism, to a plant-based diet, I should say, because it wasn't about animals or the environment because I knew nothing about it. I transitioned to a plant-based diet for my health in the uh, 1980s when I was living in Japan. And I was a total cheese addict. Um, and everything rich and gooey and delicious and creamy uh, because I was a uh, big fan of French cuisine and ate at every single French restaurant in Tokyo that I could find because there were more Michelin-starred restaurants in Tokyo than in all of France. And so I was quite enamored with that. When I became vegan, I had to figure out how the heck to make all of this delicious food using just plant-based ingredients. And that was really when I plunged into cooking. And it led to my first cookbook in 1990, the Now and Zen Epicure. And then uh, my first vegan restaurant in San Francisco in the 90s, Now and Zen, which morphed into a natural foods company which manufactured the world's second leading turkey alternative, not the first, which was, what do you think? Tofurkey, but the second, uh, which was called the Unturkey. And uh, we also made uh, a product called Hip Whip, which was uh, the leading non-dairy whip topping on the market at the time. That was you? Yeah, it was me. That was all me, Mr. John Ted. And uh, also made uh, cookies and cinnamon rolls that were vegan and diabetic for United Airlines for Ten years, so I did that for a long time, and then I wrote a couple of other books—a Japanese cookbook and another, and a revised edition of um, um, the Now and Zen Epicure called the New Now and Zen Epicure. <laughs> um, and then uh, uh, I talked in the McDougal program for ten years, cooking uh, for Dr. McDougal, and I just stopped doing that about a year ago when I just got too busy. Um, and then in 2012, I wrote. Uh, Artisan Vegan Cheese, um, and then most recently, yeah, um, this cookbook, The Homemade Vegan Pantry, The Art of Making Your Own Staples, from which I will be um, doing some recipes later on tonight, downstairs at 6.30. Um, so, um, and then I started this cheese company, Miyoko's Kitchen, which you all had some of the other night. So that is my bio. Um, I want to just say, starting out, that I'm going to keep this, I know I'm supposed to have a full hour, but I, there's somebody here that is far more important than I am. Someone who has done so much to promote veganism and uh, compassion for animals for many, many, many years, and I'd like to have this very special guest take stage um, a little bit early towards the end of my um, question and answer period. So. Um, I'll introduce him later. Um, well, I can introduce him now. Um, he's somebody who has rocked my world and influenced me deeply. Uh, the mad cowboy himself, Howard Lyman. He's just a guest on this crew, so you know we don't want to put him on the spot and make him work too hard, but we would like him to join the stage uh, in a little bit. So for the next, um, I don't know, 40 minutes or so, I'll take your questions and answers, and then we'll turn the stage over to Howard. So that's about it, and I'm ready for the first question if anyone has uh, anything they'd like to ask me. Or if not, we'll, <laughs> we'll, I can do a song and dance routine like I did last year, or let's see, uh, I can tell some more cheesy jokes about cheese, but yes. How did you figure out to do the fermentation of the cheese? What was the, you know, the jump when you were like, oh, if I did it the same way or similar way? So. Yes, uh, you know, cheese is something that has been my passion for many years. 
And once in in people don't create things in a vacuum. You know, as we, we go about the world, we're always getting hints and ideas from so many different places. Um, so it was really a confluence of many, many factors, including um, the fact that I had been playing around with cashews for a very long time, since the 1980s, um, you know, before cashew cream became a word. You know, I was playing around with cashew cream um, or puree and cashews. I just didn't know what to call it at the time. Um, and and uh, playing around with fermented tofu. I know recently there's a, there's a lot of people talk about misozuke, but that's something that's been around Japan for a really long time. I first saw it on a TV show in Japan where these nuns were doing these crazy things with tofu. One of them was burying it in miso. Another thing was burying it in ash and, and just waiting for months and, and just you know seeing how tofu transforms. So I had done my own experimenting with tofu, um, found that miso by itself was too strong, so I combined it with white wine and mirin, which is a Japanese sweet sake. And that's in my first cookbook, by the way. And um, making miso zuke in that manner. Um, and in, at my restaurant, we were making some very, very rudimentary cashew cheeses. Um, not exactly fermented. Um, but then I started reading about um, cheese making, dairy cheese making, and adding enzymes to co coagulate the proteins in certain milks. And by the way, it doesn't work with cashews, it does with almonds, uh, because almonds are higher in protein than cashews. And you need that coagulation takes place on proteins, not on just starch. Um, so I started playing around with um, trying to apply various cheese making techniques to plant-based ingredients. Um, and at the same time, the raw foodists were doing some experimentation. You know, there was uh, there were very rudimentary cashew cheeses that the raw foodists were doing. Most of the time, they would just ferment it for about 24 hours, and then that was it. That was your cheese. Um, you didn't really, you know, they weren't doing a whole, 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 whole bunch more beyond that. So I just kind of married all of these different principles uh, a number of years ago and just started playing around with it. And finally, one year, I just decided, you know, um, I'm just going to focus on this. Um, I'm just going to spend a year focusing on just making vegan cheese and culturing all kinds of ingredients, you know, not just cashews, but all kinds of nuts and grains and various other things to see what worked, what didn't work, etc. And my kitchen just turned into a virtual laboratory. Um, it was very bizarre looking. You'd walk in and there were just all these things growing. And sometimes it wasn't just the cheeses that were growing, but things growing on the cheese that you didn't want. Mm -hmm. And it looked kind of, uh, you know, scary at times. Um, but anyway, so that's kind of how I got started with that process. Lots of trial and error and experimentation. Yeah. I've got a question for you. Yeah. Where do you source the fig leaves from? Are they from California, or where are you getting your? Oh, okay. So the fig leaves actually um, are well, we're a certified organic facility, so we source them from a fig grower in California. Um, and they picked the fig leaves. I think they were kind of surprised when we called them and said we wanted to get, buy 10,000 fig leaves. <laughs> um, you know, because no one had ever done that before. And we had to work out a price. And then we had to figure out how to get the fig leaves because they wouldn't deliver because they don't do that. Um, and, you know, normally they go to a produce distributor. So we had to have someone go and pick them up. And that person is sitting right there. <laughs> so she's actually done a couple of fig leaf runs. But actually, now we, we're having them delivered because we just can't, we just have to figure out some other way to do it. You know, we can't rely on the goodness of, of people that are desperate for vegan cheese all the time. So, <laughs> um, yeah, so that's, that's where the fig leaves come from. Um, I got a question. Yeah. Uh, we're talking about bonsoi at uh, lunch today, and, and then I said that you have a recipe for making one and what you can do with the, the pulp that you can make like fish cakes or things with the pulp from the soy milk. Oh yeah, you're talking about okara. Yeah. So yeah, um, anyone made soy milk before? Yeah. yeah. That's so that's one of my, the recipes in my book. And when you make soy milk, you end up with this pulp because you grind up the soybeans and you press it to get the milk. And just like making almond milk, you end up with this pulp that's just called okara, okara in Japanese or okara in English. The pronunciation changes, you see. Um, but anyway, so you it's kind of this fluffy white stuff. And a lot of people don't make soy milk because they don't know what to do with it. In fact, what soy milk producers do is they feed it to hogs because you know they just make 
tons and tons of it, and uh, they just give it away to farmers. Um, but actually, it's very nutritious. It's all the fiber in the soybean, and you can make lots of fun things with it. It makes things very flaky. So in my book, I have a rest. One of the things that I do with the book is you make something, and if there's something left over, you turn that thing also into another thing, so there's no waste. So with the okara, you can turn it into things like um, fish cakes or crab cakes. Um, you can, you know, you can make, I used to make um, one of my first businesses, well, my very, very first business in Japan, uh, well, in my life, actually, was in Japan when I became a, a vegan. And um, I wanted to prove that you could make delicious, healthy desserts. So I invented a vegan pound cake using okara. And I didn't have any mode of transportation in Japan. Um, you know, you take the subway. So I had this big backpack, and I would put it in this backpack, and I would take um, 60 pound cakes. So they're a pound each, so it was 60 pounds on my back, and I would just take the subway and deliver them to all the stores. But um, so it's it, yeah. It, the book has several recipes using okara, um, especially the crab cakes are really really great because uh, it gives that sort of flaky texture of crab to it. But there are many other uses for it as well. Yes? Uh, so vegan cheese is mostly trial and error sort of thing, right? So we've all tasted the successes. Uh, do you have any great failure stories? <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, there are, oh yeah. Oh my, for every successful cheese, I mean, there are gonna be many, many others that don't succeed at all. Um, you know, a lot of it, I think getting the the texture of the cheese to become smooth and with, especially with the cheeses that melt, that was probably my biggest challenge. Um, you know, getting a cheese that was, the flavor comes from aging, but the texture also comes from aging. And as vegans and as people who like to eat things in a hurry, it's always good if you go to the Lido deck. <laughs> but if you're trying to make something um, from scratch that's like vegan cheese, you really need patience. That's the single biggest ingredient. And if you don't have that, um, it's, you know, I, I would say the biggest failures are when I've tried to make something that was instant that would satisfy people. And it just doesn't work. Because really, the flavor and the texture of a really good cheese a dairy cheese comes from aging. It doesn't, you know, you don't go in and make a cheddar cheese in one day. And vegans, it, it, people, they, they look at my book and they go, oh my God, I gotta make this rejuvelac and then I gotta make this cheese and let it sit for a few days and then I have to age it for another two weeks. I mean, you know, what, I mean, there's recipes on YouTube where I can make a vegan cheese in 15 minutes. Well, you know, it's probably gonna taste like it was made in 15 minutes because it just, you can't get something with a fullness of flavor without the patience that's involved. I mean, that really is, waiting that long time, you know, just ha is what makes it really, really good. So I think initially I was really trying to rush everything and I finally just realized, you know, that's not, that's not what I want to do with my cheese. I mean, there's a million recipes out there for making an instant vegan cheese, but I don't want to do that. What I want to do are cheeses that have depth of flavor and the right texture, and that just takes time. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question or not. I've had many, many other disasters in the kitchen. Um, but one of the, the recipe that was probably the hardest for me to master was a vegan eclair, um, pub, uh, shoe pastry. And um, I decided, I devoted a week to it one time and I made it like 30 times and it, I couldn't get it right. And I finally gave up and the following year, Veg News asked me to write an article, a French food article, and they asked me, oh, can you make an eclair? <laughs> and I'm like, um, I don't think I can, but I gave it another dozen times, and this time it worked. Um, so, you know, there's many, many disasters that people don't even see in the kitchen until, um, because they only see the things that, that work, that come out of the kitchen. Fran. Yeah, so when you, when you're trying something, you know, 15, 30 times, and I relate to that, and then you get it, do you do it again to make, to see that you really got it? Or you just go, yay, I got it? Oh, no, of course I do it again. Not only do I do it again, but like for, for writing my cookbook, I have many, many testers. Right. You know, you send recipes out. Um, I've got two testers sitting right here. 
um, you know, I sent recipes out all over the country and people had to test them and they'd say, oh, you know, after the sentence cuts off here or you, um, you've you got, you know, vanilla extract in the ingredients but you don't say when to add it. I mean, so they're really, really great for pointing out all these little errors that you make um, or omissions or whatever. Um, and they're also, you know, but the thing about testing is, um, you know, everyone tests in a different way, meaning um, a half a cup, my half a cup might be different from your half a cup. Now, I know that sounds crazy, but I, I can only say this because I've seen, in teaching many, many classes, seeing people measure a half a cup. Some people measure right to the line. Some people measure above the line. Some people measure below the line. And, you know, they think they're measuring a half a cup. So, um, you know, sometimes you know, when something doesn't work, I've had testers write to me and say, I made this recipe and it didn't work. And then I'll ask them nicely, can you try it one more time? And they try it and they go, oh wow, I don't know why, but it worked this time. So, um, you know, there's always room for human error even when you test something over and over and over again. So, I, every recipe I, try, I create is tested multiple times. Um, I can tell you that for sure. <laughs> Yeah. What are the properties that create the elasticity and the meltability in vegan cheese? Well, what creates a meltability in any kind of cheese is fat. So, fat or liquid. So, to get that real sort of gooey, uh, melty consistency, you need some sort of oil in it. Um, you know, that's why cheese is so high in fat. So a, a, high, a melty cheese is not necessarily the healthiest, although in my new book, The Homemade Vegan Pantry, I do have three melty cheeses that have no added oils whatsoever, because I really wanted to create one that didn't have any. It won't, um, they're cashew based, um, but they have no added oil. But the Artisan Vegan Cheese book does have oil in it, and it creates more of a, I would say, a more authentic cheese experience, um, if you're looking for that. Um, and the stretchiness for vegan cheeses comes from not casein, but tapioca, which lends a stretchy consistency. Um, so that, you know, if you read any kind of vegan cheese package like Deo or whatever, they typically have tapioca flour in it. Um, it's a starch that gets real stretchy. Uh, things like cornstarch do not. So, you know, all those starches aren't interchangeable. Well, I get a lot of questions like, can I just use cornstarch? Well, you can, but you won't get a stretchy cheese. Um, it'll thicken, but it won't get stretchy. So there's, you know, there's a reason why certain ingredients are used and not others. Um, so. Yes. So think about your Claire. What's the recipe you haven't cracked yet? What is a recipe I haven't cracked yet? I was thinking about that recently, and I thought, oh, I haven't made that yet. And now I am having trouble remembering what that was. <laughs> but I will remember. Um, I will remember what that was. Maybe somebody can remember for me, or I don't know. What are what are some things that people haven't have struggled with? Any anything? People because it might be something. Can you can it, you've all cracked everything? No. <laughs> Raviolis. Yeah. What? Tortellini. Tortellini. Oh, that's just that's making pasta. Easy. You know, I I wasn't going to tell. Well, let's see. If we have time, I might even if I can get three cups of flour and some hot water, I might even make some hand rolled pasta downstairs for the demo, because uh, the book is all about making your own staples, including a very easy, rustic 15 minute pasta. Uh, and you can, you know, that's just, that's just making your own fresh pasta. And then you can roll it and fill it any way you like. So that's, that's easy. Um, it's just knowing how, and I might just show you how. So um, yeah, uh, let's see, anything else? Anything else people have struggled with? Like what's really, really hard? Meringue. Well, that okay. That's a funny one. That is a hilarious one. You're you're ch you're just ch joking right now. Okay. So meringue. I have a wonderful vegan meringue in my book made out of flax seeds, and it whips up, and you can bake meringue cookies out of it and everything. And I was so proud of my vegan meringue. I thought this is going to be revolutionary. People are going to see my book, and they're going to go, "Wow, she cracked the meringue code too." 
And my book came out in June. And then earlier this year, someone in France discovered that all you had to do was drain a can of chickpeas and whip up the milk, the water from the chickpeas, and you got meringue. <laughs> and it got dubbed aquafaba, and it's all the rage now on the internet. So everyone is making aquafaba meringue. It's so easy. All you do is, I mean, because mine, you have to, you take the flax seeds and you mix it with water, and then you have to boil it. And then you strain the flax seeds and you get this egg white stuff that's completely gooey. Um, and then you can whip that up into meringue. But actually that egg white stuff also works for the eclairs. It also works in making a vegan omelet that is fabulous, um, that's more egg-like than tofu-like. Um, and you can make crackers out of it. You get this, it helps to bind it and make things very brittle and, and crisp. So actually it does have other uses, but the aquafaba thing was just totally, it just totally took the wind out of my sail, you know? It was like, oh my God. <laughs> no, I mean, I was thrilled because now I don't have to cook the flax seeds if I want meringue. All I have to do is drain a can of beans um, and then whip up the, the liquid. So yeah, I mean, it's wonderful that there's so many discoveries being made in uh, vegan food all the time. Um, you know, it's just making it easier and easier for everybody. Yes? Uh, what about marshmallows? Are you trying to make vegan marshmallows? Yeah, so marshmallows are not in my book because, um, so I, I know some people have had success using aquafaba, the, the bean water with marsh. Have you, have you done that? Made yeah, marshmallows? Alicia has. Alicia, she's made marshmallows and have, are they good? Yeah. That you've tried them? I've seen them. Or you've just seen them, okay. So, I, yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, a lot of people post pictures, and then you say, oh, how did it turn out? And they go, well, it looked great, didn't really work out all that well. I don't, have you ever seen that before, where something looks really great on the internet, and then they're like, well, you know, I, it, still needs, it's still in beta or whatever. So, uh, pictures don't always tell a thousand words. Um, but, um, I don't know, uh, the, uh, the meringue story is that my, my publisher um, kept asking me, can you add a, at the very last minute, it was like, can you make a meringue, can you make a meringue? And I, um, not a meringue, a uh, marshmallow. And I just couldn't make it work with the, the flaxseed stuff. Um, and I talked to some people, because I, I want a book that's really whole food space. I didn't want to put in things like isolated soy protein. And most of the uh, marshmallows that are on the market have isolated soy protein. You need a, you need a protein for, to keep the, uh, whatever you've whipped up from deflating. So if it's aquafaba or it's, the flaxseed meringue, you still need some sort of protein. So I'm not really sure, I haven't had the aquafaba mar um, mar marshmallows, so I don't know, um, I don't know if there's enough protein in the bean water to keep it from deflating. So basically, long story short, I was not successful making marshmallows without using isolated soy protein, which I didn't want to put in the book, so I didn't include it. Um, I've never been a marshmallow fan either, you know. Um, I don't know how many, a lot of people are, but um, just was a little too sweet for me. I like things a little less sweet. So, yes? Angel food cake, try that. I'm sorry? Angel food cake. Angel food cake, I have made um, a, uh, that, that is it, that's it. That's the, that's the one that I haven't succeeded with. Yes, thank you, angel food cake. Um, I haven't spent a lot of time making it either. Um, and I know a lot of people have experimented with aquafaba. I haven't been keeping up with that Facebook group about aquafaba yet, but I don't think I, I haven't seen anyone succeed with it yet. Um, so I tried with my flaxseed meringue, and um, I made souffle with my flaxseed meringue, and it was wonderful, uh, you know, fluffy and light. Um, but not the. Um, not angel food cake. On the other hand, I haven't spent anything but that. Um, haven't done that yet. That's what it is. Yeah. Any more questions? Yes? What kind of uh, cheeses are in the works? Uh, so, um, you know, we're running out of space. We only have so much. Uh, we have this aging room where we can age up to about, I think, like 15 to 20,000 rounds of cheese at any given time. Um, and then we have a lot of cheeses that are fresh. Um, I made the mistake, I am enamored with bloomy rind cheeses. Do you know what those are? Yeah. The ones where you grow the mold on the outside, you get a fluffy white mold like Camembert or Brie um, or Campozola or you know, a whole host of, of um, all the cowgirl creamery cheeses have bloomy rind on the outside. So it's a mold and I am enamored with them and I make them at home and I love them. Um, I have a little aging room at my house, um, 
It is a broken down refrigerator <laughs> um, that my husband brought home and it works perfectly because it maintains that, that perfect temperature, it's like 55 degrees. And um, so I wanted to, so I, I love making Bloomy Ryan cheeses and I want to introduce those. Um, also a Roquefort, I made one also using Penicillium Roqueforti. So these are truly inoculated cheeses. So they're inoculated with various molds. Penicillin, they're forms of penicillin. Penicillin Candidum and Penicillin Roqueforti. Um, unfortunately, when you grow the mold on these cheeses, they tend to hop over to the next cheese. So I thought last a couple of, uh, last Christmas I thought oh it'd be fantastic if we could have some bloomy rind cheeses, and I ex I made a couple hundred rounds and we put them into the aging room and next thing you knew, I had mold growing on all these other cheeses. <laughs> so um, that and the fact that the uh, re refrigeration broke down for a while, we had to throw out 11,921 rounds of cheese. Um, I have already forgotten that number because um, <laughs> it brings me to tears every time I think about it. So at this point, we're not making Bloomy Rhine cheeses, but we are definitely planning to make those in the future when we get another facility. Um, at the same time, you know, we have a limited edition cheese every single month. So we've got um, this wonderful buffalo mozzarella that is delicious both cold and at, it melts beautifully on pizza and browns and everything. It's phenomenal. Has anyone had that? A few of you have actually ordered and had it. So we have that and then we have a, um, a cultured European style butter. Um, I have a recipe for a vegan butter, the glorious unbutter, the glorious butterless butter in the book. Um, but this is a cultured one that we're going to be we're going to start making, and those those will be rolling out next year uh, at retail. Yes. I was wondering uh, where can you get your cheeses, and are you planning on expanding to like Whole Foods or? Yeah, so we're at Whole Foods in North in California right now. Right now we're in about 250 stores, mostly mm -hmm. on the West Coast and we sell online. Uh, we just got into UNFI, which is a major distributor that goes throughout the country. And so our products will start, uh, they're in a handful of shops, stores on the East Coast right now, but it'll start filtering in, onto, um, throughout the rest of the country very shortly. And we should be in pretty much, if everything goes right, this is a big secret, but we may be making a deal with a large chain that someone just mentioned that I shall not repeat because you didn't hear it from me. But if it all, if all goes well, we'll we should be uh, you should we should be at the local at your local uh, next year. I mean, every, you know, most of them, uh, all of them actually. Uh, yes. What about Australia? Well, we already in, we are already in Australia. Uh, we sell through a distributor in Australia, um, limited number of stores, and we're switch. Uh, it's limited right now because. Um, we are hand wrapping everything. We're getting a big vacuum pack roll stock machine uh, at the end of October. Mm -hmm. And we'll be able to pack 2,000 units per hour, I think. Right now, it's gonna save us something like seven work days per month. Right now we spend, you know, we have like a crew of six folding, che wrapping cheese all the time. And that job's gonna go away. So we're really excited about that. And then we'll be able to export more to uh, Australia. We also export a little bit to Hong Kong right now and um, the CEO of Vegans just came by last week and they want to start carrying our product in Europe as well and distributing it throughout Europe next year so um, we're hoping to ramp up we're hoping to ramp, scale up really really fast um, next year we're really excited yeah. Yeah. What's, what's the time look like? Okay, um, let's take like one or two more questions and then I'm going to segue to Howard. Are there any other questions? No one is dying to ask me any more questions than, uh, yeah, okay. Are you thinking of uh, trying to make yogurt? I'm sorry? Yogurt. Yogurt? yogurt? Yeah. Uh, not at this time. I know it's really unfortunate that whole soy went out of business because um, they were so terrific. Um, but. In, um, right now, that's you know we're we're going to focus on filling up the cheese case with vegan alternatives because the you know what we really really want to do is be the answer for people that transition that are making that transition away from dairy 
I mean, that's the biggest thing that people can't, people cannot give up. They can't give up cheese. You know, we hear it time and time again. And we don't want to give any excuse. So if someone's looking for Parmesan, we want to have that Parmesan, that the real hard, gradable Parmesan that, you know, that will fill any, any pasta dish you can imagine. You know, we want to be there with all the bloomy rind cheeses, um, all the hard cheeses. We want to be there with every kind of cheese you can imagine so you can have everything from a grilled cheese sandwich to a fancy wine and cheese party, just like we had the other night. Um, so we're gonna focus on that because that we feel is the hardest thing for people to give up. And you know, we really are on a mission. I mean, we, whoa, we are, this is a, we're going into a storm. Um, you know, we are, we're, Miyoko's Kitchen is, is founded Primarily because we don't want people to, to eat animals or enslave animals or harm animals. I mean, it really that's that's the reason we started this company. Um, you know, it's it's a wonderful group of vegans um, in management, and um, most of the employees are also vegan. Not everybody, but um, you know, we just want to do whatever we can. The future of food is such that. Um, Dialogue and coercion and um, whether it's dialogue or coercion or going in and standing with signs outside of a restaurant and saying, you know, don't eat meat. I mean, it doesn't matter how much you understand it up here. You have to be able to change your taste buds. You know, you have to make, you have to be able to be satisfied because we mo most people make decisions about what they eat with their mouths and their, their stomachs. And we want to be able to take away every single excuse. Um, and so we feel that you know something like gourmet cheese or delicious cheese, that really answers to people's taste buds. Um, so we're gonna focus on that and also butter and you know all the other things that are, that make it really hard to do a wonderful, to do gourmet vegan, uh, to make gourmet food. I mean, I think a lot of people are looking, I mean, there's a lot of alternatives for comfort food, but if you wanna make really, really haute cuisine or high-end food, You've got to have great ingredients to start out with, and we want to be able to supply those ingredients. And Laura, you had a question? Yeah, just real quick, more or less, how long can I keep the cheese in the refrigerator or the fat home? Um, well, it depends on the cheese. The fresher cheeses that are soft, a uh, shorter time, usually 30 to 60 days, and the harder ones, um, you know, it, we, it says 60 to 90 days, but sometimes it's more like, depends on the cheese, it could be 120. I've had I've kept cheeses for up to a year, so you know it'll just get harder and harder, and sometimes more complex tasting. So you have to just kind of observe it. And is it possible to freeze any of your? Cheese? Can you freeze the cheese? Yeah. Um, yeah, especially the fresh ones. You can freeze those. <laughs> the hard ones, you know, you can freeze them, but they don't really benefit from from freezing. So, Brian, I can tell the cheese goes bad if like you keep aging them. Saying they just go good. Oh well, you know, if it if it doesn't have mold on it, if, if it grows mold, I mean the thing with, with cheese is that if it's white or green mold, it's non-toxic, generally speaking. You can just cut it off and eat it with a hard cheese, just like with dairy cheese. So um, sometimes, you know, it even adds flavor um, to have a little bit of mold grow in your cheese. So that's non-toxic. I mean, that's really it. It doesn't. It's not going to go bad, bad. You know, uh, um, like it's going to get sour or anything like that. The flavor will improve, um, but it's whether or not you know something that you don't want to see grows on it or not. So, well, so if there are no more questions, I would like to bring into this sumo ring up here the one and only Mad Cowboy, Mr. Howard Lyman.